feeding now. We are live indeed. And the room is should now be opening. Brooks, we should be ready for our fourth and final live presentation of Solving the Paperless Puzzle. I am Steve Dotto, and I am pleased, ever so pleased, to welcome you all into our little webinar if today. still having issues. So here is the, the, for the rest of today, what we are going to do, or the rest of this webinar, is I'm going to pass things over to Brooks Duncan, who I call the Pontiff of Paperless. And he will walk us through uh, the, our webinar today on going paperless. I will remain in the chat room through the entire through the entire thing, uh, engaging with you in chat. And then at the end of it, we'll come back, we'll take questions, we will fill you in on a brand new course that Brooks has been working his uh, tail off on if you really want to uh, fast track your way to the paperless. And you ask questions, and I'm going to let Brooks take over and start helping you on your journey towards the paperless office. Take it away, Brooks. All right, fantastic. And so like Steve was saying, we love the chat room. Uh, in fact, the saddest part of me talking is I can't see the chat room at the moment. So yeah, if you're making, if you have questions as we're going through, feel free to ask it, but just mark it as a question so that Steve and I can go back and go through and answer it. And we try to answer all the questions if we can. So thank you so much for being here. Steve and I, a while ago, some of you may know, we did a webinar on Evernote. And what we realized after doing that, based on, you know, people love the webinar, but what we realized is that there's a lot more to going paperless than just one particular tool. There's a whole bunch of stuff around it. So that's when we started talking, we decided to create this webinar called Solving the Paperless Puzzle, where we take you through all the main things you need to know in order to have a successful paperless project. And paperless is one of those things that means different things to different people. For some people, it's about going green. You, you see that a lot when you read about going paperless online. For me, it's not necessarily about that, but for some people, it is. For some people, it's having a clean and tidy desk, you know, that that perfectly clean desk. Uh, that's not wasn't really my motivation, but for some people that is one. I always like to throw this slide in because this guy just completely cracks me up. He, if you look up photos about going paperless, somehow this guy comes up. It looks like he's got the best of both worlds. He's got that clean and tidy paperless desk, but he's also going green working in a jungle there. So I call that guy Mr. Paperless. So all sorts of reasons why people go paperless. For me, the, I started doing this back in 2008 when I was moving from a, one house to another one and I was lugging my big filing cabinet that was bulging with paper and I realized, you know, why am I keeping all this paper? I don't even need 99% of it. There's got to be a better way and that's when I personally started looking into going paperless. And my initial motivation was, like I said, getting rid of this paper that, that I don't need anymore and saving my back when I move. But what I found the biggest benefit for me for me has been the ability to find the information I need right when I need it. Wherever I am, if there's a document that I need, I can very quickly and easily get to it. So I'm going to talk about going paperless and I'm going to talk about it from three main perspectives. The first is how do we eliminate paper? If there's paper that we have that we want to eliminate, how do we go about doing that? The second is how do we create a paperless workflow? How do we go end to end from physical paper to having our stuff organized? And the third is how do we protect our electronic information? How do we keep our paperless documents safe and secure? And so we're gonna get into that, but I do wanna talk about the kind of paperless elephant in the room, which is actually the word paperless itself. It's one of those words that can sometimes provoke reactions uh, from different people. And, you know, for me, going paperless does not necessarily mean eliminating all of your paper. Uh, even if that's something you want to do, it's probably not going to happen. So for me, you know, and, and for some of us, we don't want to get rid of all our paper. You know, 
Some people like writing in notebooks. Some people like reading paper books. Some people like, if you're reviewing, uh, you know, if you're reviewing documents, some people like being able to jot in the margin and highlight and redline things. There's paperless equivalents to all those things, but sometimes we just we like doing it the paper way. And for me, going paperless is not about taking away things that work for you. For me, going paperless is just making sure that whatever paper we use and whatever paper we keep, I like to think of it as doing a job for us. So it's a conscious decision that we're using and keeping that paper. We're controlling the paper. We're not letting the paper control us. That's what going paperless means to me. Now that being said, there sometimes are some compelling reasons why you might want to look into going paperless. I'm not somebody who goes around uh, kind of advocating it. I don't go around telling people you should go paperless. Usually that's a decision that people make on their own and then they look for solutions. But there are some reasons why it might be helpful for you. And the first is that paper just takes up physical space. You know, I, I mentioned about my filing cabinet. I was talking to somebody a while ago and he was telling me that his company has an entire floor of an office building in downtown Vancouver just taken up by paper files. And these aren't files that they're working with, and these aren't files that they're keeping for some sort of regulatory reason. These are just files that they've accumulated over time. And if you know anything about Vancouver real estate, you'll know that that's just an insanely expensive proposition. The other thing is that physical paper is not searchable. So if you're looking for a document, you've got to find where that document is. You've got to find the drawer that it's in. You've got to find the folder that it's in. You've, inside the folder, you've got to find the piece of paper. And inside the piece of paper, you've got to find the information that you're looking for. Paper's not shareable. So if, you, if I'm working with you on a project and I give you a document, I've now given you that document. Yes, of course, we can make a copy, but then that adds to that physical paper issue that we were talking about earlier. And paper has very limited backup. So if I have this piece of paper here on my desk and I spill coffee on it, that paper is now destroyed. And you know I could lose a, a, a file, I could misplace a document, I could put it in the wrong place, and all there's all sorts of ways that we can lose physical paper. And again, yes, we can make copies of it, but again, that adds to all the problems we're trying to avoid by going paperless in the first place. So let's just say that we have some paper that we want to eliminate. How do we go about doing that? And the first thing I would recommend is starting with the goal. What are you actually looking to accomplish with this project? And the next thing you want to do is examine your paper. What paper are you using and where is it coming from? The next thing to do is you don't have to make these big, huge changes all at once. You can start small, just change certain bills, switch them to electronic if that makes sense to you, just change maybe one department if you're in an organization. You can start with these small changes first, work out the kinks, show success, and then expand it to a larger project. And finally, once you're up and running, you've made that transition to paperless as much as you choose to do, periodically you can go back and review your paperless project, make sure it's working in the most efficient way, and then once you get up and running and comfortable, you can see what else you can eliminate later. So review it from time to time. Now, one surprise that I had when I started, you know, like I said, I started going paperless in 2008 and I started DocumentSnap, uh, DocumentSnap.com, which is my started as a blog and a newsletter and I was just kind of sharing how I was going paperless and sharing I was writing all these technical articles about you know backups and automation and stuff like that and one thing I didn't take into account at the beginning which I've come to learn later is that going paperless often involves other people so you know I would be writing these technical articles and then I'd be getting emails from people saying hey you know Brooks I want to go paperless but my husband won't let me or my husband doesn't want to or I want to go paperless but my boss isn't on board. All sorts of things. And I, it really came to realize that eliminating paper 
usually doesn't involve just us. So you want to take into account the people around you when you're making these change. Get them involved as early as possible and get try to get buy-in on the project. It'll make it a lot easier. All right, once we have some paper we've eliminated, then it's time to look at what is our paperless workflow going to look like? How are we going to take our paper and make it electronic? And the first step of that is to capture our paper, taking our physical paper and changing it to electronic format. And the most obvious way to do that, I'm sure the way that all of you have, have popped into your mind, and you can see a picture of it right there on the screen, the most obvious way to do that is with a scanner. And there's lots of different types of scanners out there. And what some people do when they're starting their paperless project is they'll start with that flatbed scanner that they bought to scan photos a while ago, or they'll use the scanner that's built into their all-in-one. And it's not that you can't go paperless with those things, because you can. But if you have a decent volume of paper, either as a, a backlog to catch up or paper coming in on a regular basis, your project, I can tell you, will be a lot more successful if you actually pick up a desktop scanner. They're scanners that are specifically made for what we're trying to do here. And there's lots, again, there's lots of different types of desktop scanners out there. Some features you want to look for are you ideally want a scanner with an automatic document feeder. So that means you can take a stack of paper, put it in a scanner, and, and go. And ideally, you want a scanner that scans dual-sided. So it'll scan both sides of the page at once. Lots of different models. Here's a few. The one on the, you see there on the left is called the Neat Connect. And one feature that it has that's pretty interesting is it allows you to scan to the cloud without having to go through a computer. So if that's something you want to do, that could be an option. Uh, a lot of people want to know what scanner I personally use. I use uh, the scans, a scanner called the ScanSnap, which is made by Fujitsu. There's a couple different models of it. The one you see there on the screen is the one that I use. It's called the iX500, and that's the scanner that I personally use. Now, like I said, scanning is the most common and the most obvious way to capture paper. But nowadays, the apps on our phones are getting so good, and the cameras in our phones and tablets are getting so good that mobile capture has become a legitimate way to capture paper. Now, you might not want to sit there and scan a 50-page document with your phone, though you could if you really wanted to. But mobile scanners are great for when you're capturing documents on the go, when you're, when you're away from your desk and you want to capture something. They're great for receipts. I use my phone to capture receipts when I travel. They're great for business cards. My, my smartphone is the exclusive way that I scan business cards now. Lots of different apps out there. The one that I personally tend to use the most is called Scannable. And unfortunately, right now, it's iPhone only. Hopefully, it will be coming to Android soon. And Scannable is made by Evernote, but you can use it to scan to other places than Evernote. You don't have to use Evernote for your storage. Other options, both the Evernote and and both the Evernote iOS and Android apps both have good document scanners built right in and business card scanners as well. And Genius Scan is another good app that's cross-platform. It works on iOS, Android, and I think Windows Phone as well. So it might be worth giving, most of these apps are either free or very inexpensive. Give mobile scanning a try and you'll be surprised at how well it can work. OK, once we've captured our paper, of course, then we need to find something to do with it. And that's when we get to the biggest question that I get on DocumentSnap is organization. How do I organize my electronic documents? And for me, when I think about organization, I think of it from two main perspectives. The first is having a consistent and descriptive naming convention. And the second is having some sort of folder or organization structure that means something to you. And I say folder structure uh, in the context of files and folders on your computer, but if you're using something like Evernote or something like that, 
the same thing applies to say a notebook and tag structure or whatever platform you're using to store your documents some sort of organization structure and I want to talk about a naming convention first because the more I kind of do this going paperless stuff the more I become convinced that having a consistent and descriptive naming convention is the biggest thing that you can do to be able to find your documents later so there's a lot of different ways you can name your files here's a sample that you might use I like having the date in the file name I personally put it at the beginning and then you want to have some other words that describe the document that will help you find this document later how you structure your naming convention is not necessarily as important you have to do something that makes sense to you how you structure it is not necessarily as important as being consistent you want to try and name your documents the same way every time so that when you're looking for them later you know what to look for now organization I think of it as kind of like a step-by-step -step process or almost like an onion you know you kind of go through and you unpeel the layers so we know what we're going to name our documents then we need to think about where we're going to put them and the first decision point on that is what platform we put them on do we store them locally on our Mac or Windows computer or do we store them in some sort of cloud service like Evernote box on a network storage there's all different decisions you can make on where you're gonna store these things and for some of it are, is driven by security some of it is driven by what you need to do with these documents do you need to access them out of the office and stuff like that you want to ask yourself those questions which will help you decide where at a high level you're going to store these things and once you know where you're going to store them again this is the next step in the chain then you want to think of what kind of organization structure are you going to have and what some people find really helpful is if they have a physical paper filing structure that works really well for them with their physical paper files what some people find success with is transitioning that to their electronic files as much as possible and this can be really helpful especially if you're working with others and especially if some of them are not as enthusiastic about the change as others keeping a similar keeping a similar structure can be helpful because then it's just one less thing they need to learn it's it's just a bit more comforting that way now if you do have the opportunity to do this you could design a filing structure and this is what I did you could design a filing structure that is designed in a way that takes advantage of the abilities that we have to to work with our electronic documents and what I see a lot of people do is when they're going paperless or just working with digital files in general is they'll create these huge deep hierarchical folder structure you know layer upon layer upon layer upon layer and it's definitely not wrong to do that if you want to do that if that makes you comfortable you know go right ahead but what I found is by having less layers by having a more shallow folder structure with less layers let you know more files in less folders it makes it a lot easier and faster when we're saving documents and makes it a lot easier and faster when we're looking for documents and this becomes possible because we have that consistent and descriptive naming convention and because we learn some tricks for working with digital files so again it's not a must to do it this way but ideally what you want to do is come up with your high-level categories what are your high-level categories for your documents and then underneath there see what subfolders make sense but just keep in the back of your mind that the less clicks you do when you're work when you're navigating through your folder structure the more likely it is that you're going to stick with this stuff the more likely it is the less annoying it will be and the more likely it is that you're going to do your scanning and your processing on a regular basis now another thing that can be helpful for for working with electronic documents and having a folder structure that's thought out for digital files is it opens the door for some automation and automation is kind of a big topic that we 
you know, can't really get into too much here on, on this uh, webinar, but basically there are tools out there. One on the Mac is called Text Expander. One on Windows is called Brevi that can really help with naming your electronic documents. And there's tools out there, one on the Mac is called Hazel and one on Windows is called File Juggler that can really help with filing away documents as well. So this isn't something you need to do and I would recommend, especially if you're not super technical, I would recommend kind of leaving the automation stuff aside for the beginning. I would personally recommend get your paperless workflow down manually first and then later look at some opportu automation opportunities to make, you know, take a lot of the heavy lifting out of it. It's, but again, it's not something that's required. Now, one thing I found kind of interesting around this going paperless process is, you know, we will choose our scanner, we will create our scanning workflow in the most efficient way possible, we'll put a lot of thought into organizing our documents, maybe we'll apply some automation, maybe not, but then when it comes to actually looking for our documents, we'll kind of do it the digital equivalent of the way we've always looked for files. We'll do the digital equivalent of finding the cabinet that it's in and finding the drawer that it's in and leafing through to find the folder that it's in and leafing through that folder to find the, the page that it's on. And it's there's nothing wrong with doing that. If that's how you want to look for your documents, you know, no problem, go right ahead. But what I've found in my experience of going paperless is the biggest amount of leverage I've gotten from this transition is by learning how to search. I've gotten the most benefits out of learning how to search. And we're lucky nowadays that the platforms that we use, you know, on the Mac, on Windows, in Evernote, you know, whatever platform you happen to be using, they give us the ability to search for documents, not just by the name, but by the text inside the document. And I've gotten huge amount of benefits from being able to just instantly call up the document that I'm looking for. So I recommend at some point you take some time and just learn how the search on your platform works. It's, a, it's, it's not hard to do, but it's a skill that will pay you dividends years and years and years from now. So I highly recommend that. Now, I mentioned earlier that the biggest question I get on DocumentSnap is about organization. How do you organize your documents? The second biggest question that I get on DocumentSnap is what paper do we need to keep? So, you know, we scan this stuff, what can I get rid of and what do I need to keep? And usually this question especially revolves around tax documents. And this is a tough question because it really, really, really depends on a lot of things. It depends on where you live, which tax jurisdiction you're in, the type of documents that you have, the industry that you might be in if you're a business. There's just a whole bunch of variables. So, I mean, I know this isn't the answer that everyone would love me to give, but I really, really recommend if you're wondering this and you want to know for sure, check with the tax professional in your area. They'll be able to guide you. Um, both the United States and Canada, especially the United States, have made moves to towards accepting electronic uh, tax documents in a lot of cases. And I've even heard anecdotally from from you know bookkeepers and stuff like that that have been through an audit. I personally have never been through an audit, thankfully, but I've heard from book anecdotally from bookkeepers uh, and people like that that actually auditors like working with electronic documents. It just makes the process a lot faster. So there's a lot of benefit from digitizing your tax information, having it organized, having it searchable. That can be really, really helpful. But the question is, do you get rid of the paper or not once you've scanned it? A lot of people I talk to, there's a spectrum. Some people keep all their tax paper, even if they have it digitized. Other people tell me, forget it. I'm shredding it all. You need to make that decision in conjunction with your tax tax expert where you fall on that spectrum. Me personally, 
Um, even though I go to conferences and people call me Mr. Paperless, I personally keep the paper. It doesn't take up a huge amount of space for me, so I personally keep it. But you have to make that decision for yourself. Another question that I get asked sometimes is, do stores have to accept scanned receipts for taking stuff back? And really, I found that it varies from store to store. So what I've, what I've heard, uh, a reader gave me a great tip. What he does is when he's buying something, he'll actually ask them, you know, do you guys take back scanned receipts? And he'll write the answer on the receipt. And that way, he, when he scans it, he knows whether he needs to keep it or not. So you might want to try doing something like that. So again, talk to your tax expert about which paper you need to keep. Now for me, the most important part of going paperless is not so much how you scan your documents and is not so much how you organize your documents. For me, the most important part of going paperless is making sure that your documents are protected. And you know, there's that cliche out there, there's two types of hard drives, those that have crashed and those that will crash. And I don't know if any of you have ever been through a hard drive failure. Maybe if you have, uh, you know, let us know in the chat room. It's not a fun experience, but with a backup, it can be a lot less traumatic. And you know, we all hear, oh, you have to back up your computer. It's kind of like you have to eat your vegetables. You know, we hear that all the time. But when it comes to going paperless, it's absolutely not optional. I like to operate on the assumption that something is going to happen to my documents at all time. The way I kind of think is that the second I hang up from this webinar, hopefully not during the webinar, but the second I hang up from this webinar, my hard drive is going to fail. And I want to make sure that my documents and important files are protected for something like that happening. So you, if you're going paperless, you absolutely have to have a backup in place. It's not optional. I personally recommend you back up to at least two locations. At least one local location, so that could be an external hard drive plugged into your computer. Both Mac and Windows have backup software built right in. So you don't have to go buy a special piece of software. It's built right into your operating system. And you want to have it backed up to at least one off-site location. So it could be online backup. There's online backup services out there. Or uh, there's other ways to do off-site backup. But you want to have at least one local backup and at least one off-site backup. So backups are absolutely key, as I've said about 100 times, and I'm happy to say it 101 times. But there can be other ways to protect your documents as well. For some of us, we're scanning sensitive information and we want to know if we, if somebody were to, you know, steal our computer or hack into it or something like that, that this sensitive inf information wouldn't fall into the wrong hands. So that's when we get into encryption. And encryption can be a bit of a technical topic. So again, we don't really have the ability to get into it on this webinar. But encryption is something that not everybody chooses to do. But there's different ways you can do it. You can encrypt documents on a file by file basis. So you can password protect and encrypt individual files and you can redact inf information out of files as well. So if you have a document that has sensitive information, you can actually use tools to remove that sensitive information permanently from a document. So that's an option. There's something called an encrypted disk image which you can create, which I like to think of is kind of like a roped off section of your hard drive that whatever you save to that section of your hard drive, whenever it's locked up, no one can get access to it. And the Mac and some versions of Windows have built-in software to encrypt your entire hard drive. So I personally do that on my computer. And if somebody were to steal my computer, and even if they took the hard drive out of the computer, they wouldn't be able to get at the information on the computer because the whole drive is encrypted. So those are some options. Again, it, they're not required to go paperless. Some people choose to do it, some people don't. But it's good to know that the options are out there. So I've talked about going paperless from the perspective of eliminating paper. I've talked about some things you want to think about with respect to a paperless workflow. And I've talked about some ways to protect your inf electronic information. You've probably seen that there can be a lot of decisions to make around the paperless pro process. And there's a lot of different ways that you can go. 
and there's a lot of different information out there online about how to do it and I'm as guilty as anyone of creating a lot of this information. So it can be confusing to know what to do um, and a lot of us get into analysis paralysis. You know, we, we get so busy trying to you know, design our perfect folder structure or figure out which backup software to use that we don't move forward. And honestly, I can tell you the main thing to do is just to start. You know, learn what you need to do to get started and just try this stuff out. And once you get going a little bit, it becomes a lot faster and easier. And uh, Steve and I are here. That's why we're here to answer questions for you about how you go about doing that. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn it back to Steve now. Oh, <clears throat> all right, Brooks. Oh, there we go. Great job. I, I was listening with half an ear because I was so engaged. The chat room is on fire, Brooks. Awesome. They are That's absolutely asking some awesome, awesome questions. And one tragic bit of news. I'm just reading it now. RC actually had his hard drive on his computer and his backup drive crash on the same day. Oh, yep. You hear <laughs> oh, that, you it's hear an those. Apple device. I know. Yeah. No. Yeah, you, hear that, you, you hear those stories all the time, and that's why it's important to have it, your data in as many places as possible, and you want to have at least two backups. I actually have four backups because I'm kind of psycho about this stuff, <clears throat> yeah. but you want to have at least two. Yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll take we'll take we'll take a lesson from your pain, RC. We're sorry to hear that you had that you had that happen. But there was and uh, the very first time we delivered this webinar, I remember somebody said the three two one backup, which is three backups in two different formats. And what was the and, one thing? Uh, um, one location offsite. One, one backup lo located offsite. That's right. That's a pretty that's a pretty good set of rules. So let's jump into some of the questions. Um. Uh, Jane actually asked if anyone was having problems with the iPhone uh, flash causing uh, blank spots over, you know, overexposing an area of the paper. Um, I haven't had that. I haven't had that problem. I think that may be due to the uh, the the, uh, the scanning software. And the, have you noticed that, Brooks? Uh, I haven't noticed that, but you can always you can always experiment turning the the flash on and off in in the software. Most allow you to control that, and and it's not been a problem for me personally. Yeah, I don't think my flash goes off very often when I'm taking pictures of uh, when I'm with my documents. But, but I probably have it set for automatic. I'm just I, I'm actually not even recalling that it's a that it is an issue. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so Charles is asking, how important is a scanner with integrated PDF OCR metadata creation? He has it on his Fujitsu ScanSnap, but it adds a lot of time to the workflow of document scanning to Evernote. Right. Um, I am a big believer in. Uh, making your document searchable for one thing. So for me, I personally turn it on. There's things you can do to be able to, to uh, you can scan the documents and have it kind of OCR in the background afterwards. That's an option. Uh, the ScanSnap gives you that option and there's other software packages that can do that as well. Now the scanning to Evernote part is an interesting question. If you're a premium member, you can scan PDFs to Evernote, and Evernote will make them searchable for you. So theoretically, you could turn the, the OCR option in the ScanSnap off. That is an option that you have. I personally don't do that because uh, it depends on what you want to do with these documents. If these are documents you want to keep long term, then one thing to know about Evernote's OCR is it doesn't embed the searchable text inside the document. It makes it searchable on Evernote servers. So that what that means is if you take those documents out of Evernote someday, they won't be searchable. So I like I like OCRing it first and then putting it into Evernote, but it does take a little bit of extra time. So you're future proofing yourself, but also your system that you personally have set up, your documents don't live in Evernote. You you just store them in PDFs in your file folders on your directory, right? Yeah, I'm a heavy Evernote user, but the the way I do it is my file cabinet documents. So these are documents that I kind of want long term. I actually personally do not keep them in Evernote. I just keep them in files and folders on my computer. Uh, but ev everything else. I, I like to think of it, my file cabinet goes on my hard drive and my bulletin board goes in Evernote. So it okay. just depends what type of documents they are. Yeah. Good and stuff. Okay. Well for me. What, what, uh, Chuck mentioned, and I put it forward as a question, he's mentioned that he's starting to play with a few of the tools like Shoeboxed and Receipts. Uh, what's your take on some of these automatic um, expense tools? 
Yeah, they're really cool, and it, it depends on on what you what you're you're needing to do with it. I I personally use one called Expensify. You've they're, got a good video really... on your site about your walking through that process, don't you? Yeah, yeah, and and I like these tools because if you're somebody who needs to create expense reports or organize receipts, they can just make it a lot easier. Um, so yeah, they're they're great. I like them. Good. I, I should just point out to everybody right now. We're gonna so we're gonna be going to continue going through questions for about seven more minutes here, working through our questions. Then at forty-five minutes, at, at 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 fifteen minutes to the hour, I'm gonna take about five or ten minutes and fill everybody in on the course that Brooks and I have developed, which we are launching. It begins on June the second, so it's just a you're the last group that we're going to be talking to about the course before it goes live, and then we'll come back for more questions. And of course, if any of you have uh, any of you have uh, you have to run away for any reason, worry not. The replay will be sent out very shortly. Um, okay, so let's move. Uh, RC is asking a good uh, iOS mobile app for receipts. Um, well, I, I use I use Scannable for all my receipts, but then I and then I sync them into Evernote and I keep them all in a Evernote uh, in an Evernote uh, uh, notebook. Uh, which I share with my accountant. Uh, how do you? What, what do you use for receipts, Brooks? Yeah, I use the Expensify app for that. Um, okay. And uh, uh, but other good ones are Shoebox, which was already mentioned. And if you're somebody who uses the Neat, like uh, I know our mutual friend Mike Vardy, he does this. He uses an app called Neat, uh, which will capture the information out and store it in your Neat database. So if you're a Neat user, uh, the Neat app is uh, okay. Good. Let me just take a look. RC, uh, oh, we were talking about a good iOS app for receipts, and so you mentioned, I mentioned that I use just Scannable and store the receipts in a folder or in a notebook that I share with my accountant, and Brooks, you said? Uh, I use Expensify, but Shoebox and Neat are also good as well. Okay, good stuff. Yeah, it looks like, it looks like there's bandwidth issues for anybody that's having kind of a... Uh, fuzzy feed right now, and that's something that's completely beyond our control. Uh, so, I, so we apologize for that. If you, yeah, yeah, there's nothing we can do at that point. Just kind of keep plunging ahead and know that the replay will be good because the feed that I'm getting has been perfect here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. okay. Next question that we have here is uh, Evernote Premium does the OCR metadata. Uh, well, Evernote Premium does the OCR metadata creation in PDFs. True question mark, and the answer is yes, right? Yep, but uh, it is true. But like I said, uh, it only it doesn't embed that information in the PDF. Evernote keeps it on their server. So if you take that document out of Evernote, it won't be searchable. And also there's limits about the size of the PDF that it will OCR and stuff like that as well. Got it. Um, Scott, great question. I heard Evernote isn't secure, so you should store important personal, so you shouldn't store important personal documents. Is this true? <laughs> um, the answer is maybe, I suppose. Uh, I know some people who will not put sensitive information in Evernote. And I know some people who put their tax returns and passports in Evernote. So what I will say about that is one thing to note about Evernote is that the information is not encrypted on Evernote's uh, servers. So if you've heard that it's not secure, that may be what it's, you've been talking about. So you have to decide for yourself uh, whether that's an issue or not. Um, but I know a lot of people do not store their sensitive information in Evernote because Evernote doesn't encrypt your data. So. And I've got a little bit of a mantra for that. I consider cloud services like Evernote to be 100% secure for anything which does not need to be secure. Uh, and an option that you have in Evernote as well is, uh, did you mention, I'm sorry, I was, I was typing, that you can store things on your local notebooks as opposed to in your sync notebooks. So you can still use Evernote but just have access to whatever it is on a single notebook or on a single computer by storing it as a local back, uh, as a local notebook as opposed to a shared notebook or a sync notebook yeah. through the cloud. Yeah. Good point. And Richard, Richard made a kind of good comment, which uh, goes along with what you just said, which is nothing is totally secure. Yes. And you, you have to under, like Steve said, if you are, you have to understand, and this applies to any cloud service, not just Evernote. If you are uploading something to any cloud service, no matter how awesome their security is, you have to understand that you are giving up at some level control of that document, and you know nothing is totally secure. 
Yeah, and Roger's saying that he puts sensitive information in local notebooks. That's exactly right. right. And right. and even then, it's you know there is there there's some risk. Things can be you know your notebook gets stolen, your computer gets stolen. Um, the Evernote also has the ability for you to encrypt information within a note. But this is a very this is a very serious process because there is no uh, fail safe. There is no backup. It's not like a password to a, an account where if you lose the key. You can never unencrypt that information. So, and that's just at a data level within the notes within Evernote. Yeah, and it's also you encrypt text in a note, but you can encrypt a document in a note. One thing you can do yes. is encrypt a document and then upload it to Evernote. That's what some yes. people do. And so George asks, if an entire hard drive is encrypted, what happens when you get a new computer? If keys are with that computer, it sounds like a dumb question. Um, not I a dumb know. question. Yeah, not a dumb question. But it, if you, as long as you have the passphrase, uh, it it should be fine. Yeah, I, I've never actually moved a migrated a hard drive to a new computer, but um, I've never run into that issue. Okay, so Brooks, we've reached the point in the questions where RC is asking whether uh, how do you decide which platform to use. Uh, so I'm going to get you to jump into the chat and start answering the questions by text. And while sure. you're doing so, I am going to take over and I'm going to fill people in on our course, which you and I, well, you've been working your tail off on, and we want to make sure that people know about. So I'm just going to start screen sharing right now. And I'm going to fill people in on... Brooks and Steve's awesome new course. So we have a course, as, as I mentioned, called the Paperless Office Made Easy. Now, the genesis of this course is twofold. One is I have a series of productivity courses, which we've been selling now for nearly a year, one on Evernote called Evernote Made Easy, and another one that I produced with Mike Vardy called Task Apps Made Easy. And in the exit surveys from people completing those courses, and we've got something like 800 students that have gone through now, we ask them what topics they're most interested in, and right at the top of the list with a bullet is the paperless office. So there was a lot of interest from our community in developing a course around the paperless office. That combined with the fact that I have tried maybe three times in my life to actually go paperless, failing miserably each time, I figured I needed help from the best. And so I got Brooks to develop a course mainly for me to help me with my paperless journey. So uh, so I, I approached Brooks Duncan, of course, of Document Snap, and I said, can we do the ultimate course? Can we develop a paperless office course that really is going to teach people and walk them chapter and verse through it all? And he was up to the challenge, and this is the result, our paperless office made easy course with uh, the Pope of Paperless, Brooks Duncan. So here is a, a brief outline of what you could expect if you decide to sign up for the course. It begins June the 2nd. Now, it will be a normal online course. You don't have to take it synchronously. You don't have to take it in time. You can take it at your own pace. But for the month of June, the modules are going to be released two per week. So uh, it, it will take you th four weeks to go through the entire course if you sign up for it with us now. But you don't have to take it in that time. You can take it at your own pace and, of course, return to the lessons at any point. So we've got two different style of lessons within the course. We have the basic outline, which has eight modules, uh, starting with getting ready. The interesting thing about going paperless is, unlike most other processes, is you have to kind of start in the middle because you've got this backlog of information that you have to deal with, and you have the future, uh, you know, putting systems in place to make it, uh, as we talked about in the chat room, to make it more of a habit than a chore. If it's a job that you have to do, chances are you're going to fail. If it's a, if you have a system in place that it becomes becomes a habit dealing with your paper as it comes in so you don't have to make decisions on each page as it comes in you know exactly what's supposed to happen that's the way that you want to build a successful system so Brooks gets us started uh, in the middle with giving us and uh, telling us exactly what we should do uh, whether we should be moving forward or in reverse and how to do that Secondly, as much of the conversation today, your scanner is such an important business partner with you in this whole process. Choosing the right scanner, setting it up, and taking advantage of the features that are built into that scanner is paramount for success. So choosing and using the scanner is an entire module. Then we get into the meat and potatoes, organization, creating structure. No system is perfect. No one is right. And I imagine if, you, if you're diligent, None are wrong. It's what works best for you. But Brooks gets, gets into the questions that he gets asked the most on his site, and people are constantly asking about things like naming convention, which might not seem like a big deal to some of us, especially if you're neophytes around. 
around the paperless office, but that means everything in the future. Two, three years down the road, finding that document, knowing where it goes, knowing where it is, that is so important, uh, developing a good naming convention. And also just in the process, knowing exactly how to name things so you're not deciding different names as you're going ahead and also changing, kind of changing uh, direction. Uh, there's a lot in a name. It's like T.S. Eliot. The naming of a cat, very important. The naming of a document, very important. Then Brooks takes us through the paperless workflow, building a good habit of managing your information as it comes through. And it's really cool because Brooks actually takes us inside his workflow, which is awesome to see how somebody who's successfully living a paperless life, how they actually manage their paper and when they do things and how they do things and where they even put things. It's all important. The physical aspect of, uh, of it is as important as the digital aspect. So Brooks takes us through that. Then if you are interested in using document management software on either Windows or Mac, look, Brooks looks at the best options in that space. Then we get into, oh, maybe I think the most important aspect, cloud storage and security and privacy. Where you store, how you store your documents, how you protect your documents from crashes and from lost information, and as important, how you protect your privacy. The fact that you're digitizing so much of your personal life is putting us at greater risk than ever for losing, uh, for, for privacy invasion. Uh, so protecting it is paramount. So Brooks takes us through all of those things in module seven. Finally, module eight is anything that didn't fit in the previous seven modules. But this wasn't enough. When I looked at the, you know, when we looked at the overall what we wanted to accomplish in this course, we realized that there was a few other things that we wanted to that we wanted to include, but they didn't necessarily fit in modules. So what we've decided to do is to include three live trainings as well. Now these are going to happen in consecutive Wednesdays in the month of June. They will be available for replay. So if you can't take in part in the live uh, webinar, which is going to be very similar to what we're doing right now. Don't worry, you'll be able to watch it uh, at any point in the future. But when we designed these modules, we realized there was so much value in them that we should probably be offering them to the public, to people not just taking the course, and allow them to come and take them. But we don't want to give it away for free because it's such awesome information, so we're going to charge for it. We're going to charge not people who take the course. They get it for free, but everybody else is going to be paying. So we have three webinars that we're going to be delivering. And I love this first one. It is genius. I think that's because I thought of it. It's called the PDF Primer. We've talked a lot about the portable document format, Adobe's format, but it is so rich. We can do so many things with PDF that we often, uh, most of us overlook completely. So Brooks is going to dive into everything that you can do with PDF and teach you how to use PDF far more effectively. For example, in one of our previous webinars, one of our attendees was saying that even though they're paperless, they still print off everything so they can do reconciliations. A second person came in and said, you know, you can color your text in PDF, which I do in dual monitors, which allows me to do my reconciliations using PDF. And, and it, because I'm highlighting text in different colors and saving it in different colors, it works for me. So little things like that, little techniques like that, Brooks is going to talk about redacting information and protecting your sensitive information in PDFs and how we use it to share information finally if we have a if we have an audit or things like that. He's going to be going through using PDF like a PDF ninja. So I'm looking forward to that module. I'm really looking forward to that module. Uh, the second one is really my sweet spot, going paperless with Evernote. Everybody doesn't have to use Evernote at the heart of their paperless system, but some of us choose to. And if you do choose to, there are things that you should know and things that you should address. And we're going to be covering that. We're going to be looking at Evernote at the heart of your paperless system. Now, even if you don't use Evernote as the basic file storage system, like Brooks uses it less than I do, for example, uh, it, it still is a worthwhile tool to get to know Evernote a little more intimately. And so that's going to be our second of live uh, presentations. And the last one, Almost all of our content really deals and focuses on using and going paperless from a personal perspective, starting at that personal level. But to be successful paperless, you need it to work in your team or your family as well. So you have to have other people who are supporting your venture in paperless. So how do you instill a paperless philosophy in your family? or in your enterprise, in your workplace. So the, we're going to be going through kind of scaling up paperless from a personal to a team-based metaphor in going paperless in your small business. So we have these three bonus modules included, to a, which is, have a value of about $90. Uh, the price of the course, 
is 249. The, the first module is going to be delivered June 2nd, so now is a perfect time. If you're thinking about going paperless, give yourself this gift. We have a money back guarantee and it's 30 days, so you can go through the course. If it doesn't work for you, if it didn't deliver what we promised, then you can ask for your money back. But if you want to go paperless, the discipline and the background and the information and the uh, and the systems that Brooks is going to put in place for you is going to give you the best opportunity and the best chance to move forward. And I have one last bonus because, of course, we're on the Internet. We have to have lots of awesome bonuses. I'm including my really popular course, Evernote Made Easy, uh, as a bonus. It's $97. As I say, we've got uh, for that course, we've, all, we've sold over 600 copies so far. Uh, people have loved that course, and it really entrenches Evernote in a... Uh, as Brooks is going to be teaching us how to be uh, have a paperless habit, I teach you how to have an Evernote habit, how to use Evernote for archiving, or, or, excuse me, for research in the mobile space, for collaboration, and I take you through Evernote in ten lessons. It's a, actually I send it to you as shared Evernote notes. You actually use Evernote to take the course, but that is included in uh, and everybody has. Uh, I'm just patting myself on the back here, but everybody has loved that course. So that's it. 249, starting June 2nd. I encourage you to have a look. Now, what I... Oh, I know what I need to do. I'm going to stop screen sharing, and I've got to put this and tell, show you guys where to go. I have to stop. There it is. Okay. I'm going to populate the... Uh, there is the offer. So where you go to... There it is. So if you click on the pop-ins, or it might appear right within your uh, browser window right now, the URL if you want to go to take a look at the more information page on this. And I'm also going to put this, put the URL in the chat right now. There it is. I'm putting it in the chat. And there it is, if anybody is interested. So, Brooks, can I bring you back on board? You still there, Brooks? Did I, did I lose you? I'm back. Oh, good. Thank goodness. How are we doing? So, first of all, did I cover everything off well as far as you were you were paying attention to me, were you? <laughs> I was rocking the chat trying to answer questions here. Good stuff. Uh, so, how are we doing on questions? Should we be returning to questions? Uh, well, Michael just asked one, can Microsoft OneNote be used as a substitute for Evernote? Uh, absolutely. A, a lot of people are big... OneNote fans. So if you if you like using OneNote, absolutely no reason uh, why not to use it. It's it's a great program. And look at that, Bob just bought. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> I I, I, used to, I hope he bought that one. I better check to make sure it's a, yeah. Oh no, he bought a different course. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I just had a oh, I just had a course sale of my Evernote course, and I thought it was one of our people that was attending right now. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, Brooks. Brooks got all excited. Oh, yeah, good. Exactly. Oh, uh, RC was asking what encryption apps do Julian Assange and Edward Snowden recommend? That is a good question. I believe I've heard them recommend PGP. Uh, so, so that is one to look into, uh, an implementation of PGP. That's, that's a standard one to recommend. There are encryption built into Windows and, and Mac, like I said. Uh, I find it hard to believe that he would trust those ones because, you know, they're made by the hardware vendors, but I, I, I don't know. I, I believe PGP is the one he recommends. Good stuff. So we've got uh, about two more minutes of official time. Brooks and I will stick on uh, stick around afterwards if there are any questions we were unable to answer. But I do want to bring the uh, the webinar to a close. I know it's the weekend, and it's I don't know about you, but where I am, the weather is gorgeous. The grass is saying, cut me, cut me. <laughs> so I, we're all going to have other things that we need to get on and do. And Brooks, frankly, has to get back to work working on the, finishing off the last few modules for the course. You're play, and also, your soccer team is playing in the FA Cup final. How are they doing, Brooks? I don't know. I was a good boy and turned it off. You well, actually turned I, it I off. Thought, I thought about I thought about having a web, an iPad off to the side so I could watch while doing the webinar, but I thought I can't I can't do that to to my friends here. I so. have to, I have to share a story uh, with you. Uh, those of you in Canada know that for years and years I did a television show in Canada. It hosted a, a live TV show and, and a pre and pre recorded one as well. Uh, but my show was called uh, Dotto's uh, Dotto Tech, the same same name as this. But we used to do it on we used to simulcast a live program on Sunday. Days. And it was on radio and television, and it was a two-hour show, and we took questions about technology and computers. And in 19, in 2000, 2002, 2002 was an Olympic year, right? The, it, Canada was playing the United States in the gold medal final of hockey. And of course, our show's in Canada. And our show started at 10 a.m. in the morning, and the hockey game started at 10 a.m. in the morning on that Saturday, uh -huh. on the same Sunday morning. So when the, when the floor director counted down and threw to me live, 
there was probably nobody watching <laughs> in the entire nation. And I actually started the show up by saying, hello, tap, 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 is anybody there? <laughs> I said, if you're watching this show, you're mistaken. The hockey game's on CBC, <laughs> and we had it running in the side, and uh, as the the ebb and flow game made it so difficult for me to stay focused. It was a, It's good of you to have uh, not kept the game on. So there you go. I shared that personal story, which brought us to the top of the hour. Brooks, i got to thank you so much for sharing your time with us today, and uh, and everybody, uh, I know that you've worked hard, so I'm going to get you to say goodbye and, 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 uh, and just uh, to say goodbye to the gang. Thank you so much, everybody. Had a great time. Love hanging out in the chat room with you. Uh, thank you so much. Good. And Nigel's asking if you want to know the score. No, Nigel. Let him go and check it out on his PVR. Don't don't spoil it for him. And with that, folks, I will stick around for a little while. The chat room will be open for a little while after the uh, after I, I, I kill the live feed here. Uh, but if you are interested, take advantage of the course. Uh, there will be an email sent to you very shortly with a replay, as well as links to the uh, as well as links to the if you are interested in in jumping on board the course, which begins June the second. I hope that you found this valuable. Keep your eyes peeled in your email for upcoming webinars from us. We will be doing more and more as time goes by. Until next time, on behalf of Brooks, I am Steve Dotto. Have fun storming a castle. <laughs>